I was, I'm a Knicks fan. So in 1994, we were hoping and praying we might get our first title in a long time. We're watching the Knicks play the Rockets, as I said earlier, Ewing and Olajuwon in a great series. NBC cut away from game five of the 1994 NBA Finals between the Rockets and Knicks to take coverage of the O.J. Simpson Ford Bronco chase. Not only in the CBA, but back in his days at Ohio State, he'll give up his body as he took the hard hit from Anthony Mason. 6.39 remaining in this first half, Knicks by two. We are looking at live pictures of Interstate 5 in Los Angeles. We believe that that white vehicle, which is being trailed by a phalanx of California Highway Patrol cars and helicopters, belongs to Al Cowlings, who disappeared with O.J. Simpson earlier today. Shortly after Mr. Simpson was informed that he was going to be formally charged with the murder of his wife and the young man who was with her at the time. It is the latest bizarre development in a string of bizarre and shocking developments that have been going on all day long. That's, of course, the voice of the great Tom Brokaw nearly 30 years ago, June of 1994. NBC continued to dip in and out of the coverage of that chase. At times showed the game and the police pursuit simultaneously in a split screen. Join us now, Stephen Battaglio. He writes about television and the media business for the L.A. Times and broadcast journalist Ed Gordon. He was the first journalist to interview O.J. Simpson after his acquittal. Good morning to you both. It's great to have you with us. Of course, we're talking about this because O.J. Simpson died yesterday from cancer at the age of 76. Steve, I'll start with you. Uh, I was just remembering my father, who was a correspondent for CBS News at the time, had just flown into LAX on a reporting trip and got word that O.J. was on a slow speed chase when he was in his taxi, hearing that O.J. was a couple of miles behind him. He saw all the people on the overpasses. He witnessed the spectacle. They pulled the taxi to the side. My dad points out the guy kept the meter running the whole time. And my dad watched <laughs> as O.J. and this sort of comet, as he called it, with this flames of police cars behind him traveling up that highway in a truly bizarre spectacle that was the beginning of something, I think it's fair to say, in cable news and our media culture. It was truly a where were you TV moment. <clears throat> if you went through the uh, the Kennedy assassination or the Challenger explosion in 1986, y you can tell a story similar to what you just told. And I think it also showed that the public was really just taking control of the story. They wanted to know everything about it. Uh, you know, at this time in 1994, you know, the, uh, the evening newscast that had over 30 million uh, viewers a night, Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings, and Dan Rather, and they really dictated the news agenda. I think it stopped on this day because hmm. the, the networks, uh, the network news was still pretty buttoned down uh, institution at the time. This was a kind of a tawdry story that, that was not something that you would uh, cover every night normally. You didn't see trials like that covered. Uh, and But the public was so interested in, in all the aspects of this case, and there were places where they could see it when they wanted it. 24-hour cable news on CNN, Court TV. There was already an appetite for this type of thing. You saw it with the Menendez trial a few years before, and also the Williams uh, Kennedy Smith rape case. This just amped that up by uh, a multitude. Uh, just the uh, the uh, celebrity, race, sex. It had so many elements in it, and incredible that the public was sitting there transfixed by DNA testimony. I mean, it, it, it was almost an education in the legal system at the same time. And a few years later, of course, it would shift from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., and Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky, 24-7 as well. It, and it created a new class of journalists, the, the legal expert, the legal commentator, uh, and, and the law became something that was talked about in a pretty sophisticated degree on television after this. Yeah, uh, and this morning the Times uh, was talking about how uh, there were many tragedies here. One of the tragedies uh, was that there were two Americas on, on vivid display. I was on an airplane uh, when the verdict was announced uh, and, you know, everybody screamed. In, in shock and horror, and yet 
that was where white America was. Absolutely. I, I remember that day because it was October 3rd, my birthday. And uh, Jesse Jackson and I had done an interview at a, a local station in New York. We walked outside, the verdict had come in, and a guy was driving by, a white uh, guy with a, uh, driving a truck, and said, we'll get even with you guys. And we <laughs> said, well, happy birthday, <laughs> right? Happy birthday, yeah, I thought he was saying happy birthday. <laughs> and like, yeah. what is he talking well, about? And, and the verdict was that. But no one really uh, knew this better than Ed Gordon, who got the first interview with OJ. And Ed Gordon was uh, and, and remains one of the premier black journalists in our a country. And Ed, talk about how a lot of black America was not necessarily for OJ, but was for Johnny Cochran and being able to show that we could make the system work our way because we didn't feel that there was enough evidence for OJ. I remember Johnny Cochran had asked me to visit OJ in jail, and I said, this is not a civil rights issue. I wouldn't go. So we were torn between that we were not necessarily pro-OJ, but we were for Johnny and showing that he could defeat those that were ill-prepared to prove their case. Yeah, I think you're right, Rev. Uh, and thank you for uh, allowing me this time to talk about something. It's hard to believe sometimes uh, that it's been 30 years. But I think you hit the nail on the head. The idea that this was not about O.J. Simpson. People forget that O.J. had been a beloved football star. But as, as his time went on as a celebrity, um, his popularity in black America had waned, quite frankly, uh, by the time all of this happened. And it really was about the idea of finally seeing an African-American male in particular um, beat a system that had beat us down for so very long. That coupled with the idea of the relationship the, that the LAPD had with the black community all of those years. So it was kind of a David beats Goliath for the first time. A moment. And I think that we have to understand that this trial was really not only about the trial, but it was about America and race. Um, that was the personification of the division that has become so vivid that we see uh, today. So it was um, one of those touch tone moments that really we can look back on and say that this spoke as much about O.J. Simpson and those murders uh, as it did where we sit in America. So, Stephen, let's talk specifically about the phenomenon of cameras in the courtroom. Uh, this was a day-to-day -day drama. Americans hooked each and every moment. Uh, the, the, the attorneys, the judge, they all became celebrities. Uh, and we're having this debate again because Donald Trump's about to go on trial. And the federal courts don't allow cameras. New York, which starts Monday, doesn't allow camera. Georgia, were that to happen, does. What do we think? Is this a good or a bad thing? Uh, I think it depends on your perspective, certainly from a legal perspective. I mean, uh, let's look at the Menendez brothers. The first trial was televised. There was a mistrial. The second trial not televised. There was a, a conviction. You would have to think there was some sort of correlation there. Uh, so I think a lot of it has the, the, the point of view of the, uh, the parties involved at this point. I, I will tell you that it, the phenomenon of, of cameras in the courtroom was that they provided sort of an inexpensive way to present a saga that gripped viewers that you could see it play out in real time. And I think the demand for that type of thing among the consumer has only intensified. And if, you, if any of these trials get uh, are, are, are televised, you're going to see them streamed on multiple outlets. I mean, there were just a few places to go 30 years ago. Now it'll be everywhere. You'll have TikTok hot takes. I mean, it, it's going to be, it will be very interesting to see how this current more, much more fragmented and much much more unruly media environment will play a role in a, a, a similar case like this. And, and Ed, we, we are so fragmented when it comes to, to media, where we get our media uh, from generation to generation. But we were just showing a graphic at the bottom of the screen that 150 million Americans saw that white Bronco chase. Uh, hard to believe that that many Americans were in front of a television set at one time. Shows just how big of a moment that was. Yeah, it's certainly a different day that we live in now. And if you think about the idea from the murders to the um, acquittal and then the thereafter in the streets, America was transfixed 
on this case. Uh, this was real reality television. This was not the housewives. This is something that we uh, really viewed in the same way that we did The Bachelor and all of these things. You got to know all of the characters. You know, if you were old enough back then, you can still recite the names. It was an extraordinary time. Johnny Cochran was a true media superstar. People would ask for his autograph. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dan Abrams, whose career was launched by this, he, he said it, it was like it, it was uh, his presence was more powerful than, than walking down the street with like a, a former president or uh, or a rock star. It was just it, it's it, it's hard to describe. Yeah, it's how amazing. It was. Broadcast journalist Ed Gordon and Los Angeles Times writer Stephen Battaglia, thank you both for helping us walk through these memories of how the media landscape has changed so much in these 30 years. We appreciate it. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on Get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.